Welcome to Axel Coral Live, and we're broadcasting from the Kamabi Field Research Station here in Curaçao. Now, Curaçao is an island in the Southern Caribbean and part of the Netherlands Antilles. We're just off the coast of Venezuela, which is further south to us than this direction. And it's great to be broadcasting from a field research station such as Kamabi because it has that great mix of science facilities, lab space, we're actually in the wet lab at Kamabi at the moment, and also access to the field, to the great outdoors, uh, to the coral reef. So researchers who come here, sometimes for a period of weeks, sometimes months, sometimes even longer, can have everything they need to do their work, analyze their samples, conduct experiments in the lab, and also get out there onto the reef to study it, for real and to perhaps do some of the experiments out there on the reef. Now I'm delighted to say that for this afternoon's uh, Meet the Experts, uh, we have Mark, one of the researchers here at Kamabi. Fantastic to have you with us, Mark. Thank you. And uh, we've <coughs> got to see who we've got online joining us today. We have schools from Canada, USA, uh, Colombia and uh, the UK. Uh, and hi to all the students <laughs> there. Um, it's great. Well, we've got some shout outs. Um, we have FH Collins School tuning in from a very cold Yukon, Canada. Oof. It's minus 11 there. Um, hi to all the students there. We've got, a, I think, a 43 degree difference yeah. uh, between where you are and where we are. Um, so uh, hopefully you can bear up to minus 11. Hope your classroom isn't minus 11. But great to have you with us. Mm -hmm. uh, a big hello to INEM Santiago Perez joining from Colombia. Hi everybody um, there. We've got John Munn um, who's homeschooling from the UK. That's wonderful um, to, to connect from home to this. We've got FH Collins School in Canada and a big thank you uh, to the Blessed Sacrament Catholic Elementary for tuning in from Toronto in Canada. Welcome. I think it's probably a little bit warmer um, than it is in all those classrooms here. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, apparently uh, Canada and, and North Northeast um, America are experiencing a, a big cold snap at the moment. It's nearly down to freezing even in, in Texas. Send uh, it over. <laughs> send it over, send it over. <laughs> uh, Mark, thank you so much for being part of this. You're here at Kamabi. Uh, we talked a little bit about Kamabi in that introduction. But w what makes Kamabi and, and uh, what makes it so special? Um, Komabi is actually uh, one of the first research stations that people build in the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. And that this is right around the time where people uh, started diving for the first time, because like the uh, invention of dive gear, that's something from after the Second World War. And so right after that, like people are like, okay, now we have that. There's an ocean that you could normally only see with a snorkel, but now we can actually jump in and go much closer and see bigger areas. And that's sort of what happened. Then people found all these interesting organisms on coral reefs, and then they're like, hmm, wouldn't it be better if we had a field station close to these coral reefs so we could actually work from the f uh, nearby the field and sort of study these uh, organisms that we couldn't see uh, until recently. And that's why Kamabi came into being. So in 1955, they built this place, okay. and it's been a field station since. That's incredible. And, and what kind of research, I mean, as we sort of talked about, there are lots of different researchers, mm -hmm. teams and individuals here, but what's your specialist in term, specialism in terms of... Yeah, research? so what we got here, and, you know, we're a field station, so we're in the field, which means that, like, we're close to the water, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the only thing that we do is water, because we have uh, forests, uh, dry systems, all sorts of ecosystems on the island. And so at Kamabi, we have a lot of researchers that focus uh, on all those systems because you're right there where they grow, where they do their thing, and people are here to sort of study that. Uh, what I do is more the marine stuff, so okay. I work on, on coral reefs, pretty much. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I mean, is there a specific aspect of the coral reef? Because I know there's a lot that goes on there. You've got people looking at uh, the corals themselves, sponges, fish, all these different things. Do you have a particular... Yeah, the, the thing that I uh, have become interested in over the last few years is actually the things that you cannot see. Like okay. as, you, as, as uh, people probably know, there's a lot of uh, very small things in every ecosystem. And uh, for instance, in the ocean, you have very tiny algae, you have uh, viruses, you have bacteria, but also 
for instance, corals, before they get big, they're small too. And mm -hmm. just because there's so many things that are very, very tiny, mm -hmm. uh, people haven't really looked at them yet. And now we find out that like all these tiny things, whether it's uh, bacteria or small corals, are very important uh, by uh, in sort of determining what the whole system does. And that's sort of new, so there's a lot of stories that people don't know yet, and that's what we're trying to, f or what I'm trying to find out, is how that works. Um, and, and you were in the perfect place to do it. Absolutely. And, I mean, we're in the wet lab now, there's all these things bubbling, there's fluorescent lights all around us and everything else. Can you tell, uh, tell us a little bit about... Um, the wet lab and what, what's, what's going on here. Yeah, so it, it, it's pretty funny. We have a, a bunch of people that are working here right now. So what you see is all these different aquaria and in most of these aquaria there's pretty much a story um, going on, a sort of simplified version of what we think is happening on the reef, but sometimes it's easier to make a simple version of what we think is uh, out there and that's sort of what's going on here. So there's a few of those stories taking place or happening here right now and this is maybe uh, an interesting one to start with uh, because what you see here is um, an experiment that sort of uh, deals with this uh, sort of mystery on quarries. Like what people often don't realize is that like if you would jump in the water and sort of swim over a coral reef, there's so many corals, there's so many fish, you would think that, okay, with all that life there, there must be a lot of food there. And uh -huh. that's actually not the case. And uh, uh, if you don't think about it, like hmm, that actually makes a little bit of sense because uh, if you would jump in a tropical ocean, there's a lot of very, very clear water. And that water is, is clear uh, because there's no food in it. Like if you think about like, oh, the river behind my house, it's always brown or green. And that's because there's a lot of uh, sugars in the water. There's a lot of uh, algae growing in the water. And that makes that sort of weird color. But that's food. That's food for a lot of other uh, organisms. Uh, in the tropics, in tropical reefs, we have water that sort of looks like this. It almost looks like it's not there. And that's a problem because then how can it be? Is that there is so little food, but at the same time, how can you have so much life uh, on a coral reef? And basically what you see here is sort of how that works. It's, uh, well, if animals, there's no food, there's no little chunks in the water, there's not a lot of animals that... Uh, you can eat, but you have to make your own food. And that's what corals are really good at. So what corals do is like, okay, if there's not enough food in the water, we know somebody that can actually make it for us. And who can live from light? Those are algae. So what corals do, because everybody might think of algae as these guys, sort of uh, little plant-looking things, but okay. there's also, and this is where you sort of get into the very tiny things, the things mm -hmm. you cannot see. If you would look in the body of these corals here, you would find a lot of very, very, very tiny algae. You would have to put a hundred in a line to get to a millimeter. So they're very, very tiny. You, you cannot see them. But you can sort of know that they're algae, because like if you look at these corals, uh, a lot of people uh, think that corals are very colorful. Yeah. And in some places they are, but if you would dive here in Curacao, you would see that most corals are these sort of brown green colors it's like brown green hmm isn't that sort of the same color as plants have and that's true and the reason why colors have this brown greenish color that remind you of plants is because of these little algae that live in their bodies and what oh. these tiny little algae do is they can actually take the light turn that into sugar the uh -huh. same way that uh, photosynthesis i'm sure uh, everybody's heard about that and then uh, because they do that, like they pay the coral for living in their uh, uh, body with some sugars. Uh, so the coral is like, thank you for these sugars. So now we can live as well in these waters that don't have that much food themselves. So that's sort of, in a way, uh, sort of like here's how coral reefs grow. And that, that's incredible. So what we've got here, we've got um, coral here. It mm -hmm. uh, looks a bit like sort of someone's dropped a whole lot of brains in there. Yeah, uh, uh, spooky, got, zombie uh, land. We've got um, bigger algae, sort of seaweed here, and we've got nothing in the third one. What is, is there a reason for having... There, there is a reason for that. So, the, 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 like, okay, so then you pretty much uh, have this system where corals, thanks to these algae that live in their tissue, uh, can live in water with pretty much only light. Corals can also eat, but... Uh, Light is the uh, uh, biggest food source for, uh, source for them. But then it's sort of a problem because if all that food goes into these uh, corals and they mm -hmm. use it, like, okay, then it almost looks like there's nothing for anybody else. Okay. So if you think about fish, if you think about crabs, lobsters, all these uh, animals that live on reefs, and there's a lot of them, where do they get their food from? Because now 
energy went into the system, but it looks like it's locked in these uh, corals. The thing that happens though, and maybe people know that from plants, like if you mother or your father park their car underneath a tree, that there's all these drops on the roof and you have to clean it uh, when it happens. What, what happens there, and this is sort of what all plants do, uh, plants as things that live from uh, the sun, is they make these sugars, but not all sugars are used and they're being thrown out. So when that happens, it ends up on your car and that's what all the little splotchy things are. Corals and algae do that too. And it's these sugars that are sort of the beginning of the food chain that leads to the fish, to the uh, crustaceans, to the octopi. Because like, and this is again one of those invisible processes, the sugars are in the water, you don't see those. And then what happens is that they uh, are taken up by sponges. And sponges use the sugars in the water to make sort of uh, like little cornflakes that a lot of other species can then eat. And what you see here right now is like, okay, the algae in the corals or the algae, like little plants on the, do they make different sugars? Uh, and then determine, because that's what you see over there, you see all these jars, uh, the water sort of comes out here, it has all the sugars in it, Zoop, goes to these little blue lines into these uh, smaller aquaria uh, down here. And then what you see there are sponges. And what we're trying to do uh, right now is to sort of find out is if you give them sugars that are made by coral or sugars that are made by algae. Uh, do sponges make different cornflakes so uh, other organisms take them or they don't? Like, do you, need, do you have to have coral cornflakes uh, corn or algal cornflakes? Does that matter? So it's the sugars from these two and then the sponges will turn those into yeah. cornflakes. And, and th th there's a, because then like, who cares? The big story behind that uh, is that like a healthy reef is sort of has a lot of coral. Yep. An uh, unhealthy uh, reef has a lot of algae. So uh -huh. if these make completely different cornflakes than this, although they're both plants in a way, uh, and sponges can still make those sugars into cornflakes, we don't know whether in this system, the healthy one, the animals that eat the cornflakes are happier with what they make than what these guys make. And that's what we're trying to find out. And then we've got, a, we've got an empty one up here. Why do, why do we have an empty one? Yeah, that, that, like, uh, as with many experiments, there's always sort of, sort of a background uh, thing. Like, uh, for instance, we're pumping the water in through this um, uh, system from the ocean, which is right there. But you can sort of imagine like somebody's walking on the pier Yes. and that's a glass of coca-cola and he drops it in the ocean and then if that happens there will be a lot of sugar that we're pumping in and then that's why we're using this one as well so you can sort of measure the sugar in this one uh, that's sort of coming from outside and you don't know where it comes from to then sort of know okay whatever is extra is coming from these so it's 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 what they call in research a control so control and the control is something that some of the older students watching because i think we have quite a range of ages watching but some of the older students certainly will have whole, uh, heard about um, con con control in the, in ex yeah. the experiment and is that the, one of the ways in in, in which you to make this a, 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 you know a fair fair test or we've got other things that we can do like i can see the lights are the same the, the aquaria are the same everything you know. yeah so the, the 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 idea with a lot of um experiments in uh in science i would say is that you only change one thing so what you see here is like this would almost look the same as this and this and it's the same species of coral uh, of sponges in there the same tubing the lights are the same the only thing that differs is what's in these aquaria the ones that make sugar like, do they even make it? Because that's the other yeah. thing. Uh, uh, like, if this is the same as this, it could also mean that these algae are not making what you think they're making. And then, is the sugar made different between the corals and the algae? So it's a very simple version of a scientific experiment. But you al always try to do one thing that's different and then measure how these sponsors, uh, sponges respond to it, because otherwise you would never know what it is that these differences that you see come from. Oh, incredible, and, and we've, we've got some other. I can see some other things further, further down. Or was there anything else you wanted to? No. So that, uh, that and this is like again. This is what people. Uh, if you go to a coral reef, that's what you would see. But yeah. the only reason why this is possible is because of these algae that are in it that you cannot see. The sponges that are there, they can only live on a reef, and that's not because uh, there's a lot of food. Because of food, you cannot see. And these are these sort of examples of um, important things happening on reefs things that we're only recently discovering how they work, uh, why they matter a lot. And then uh, what you see here is sort of um, another uh, experiment. 
Because, like, okay, what, what is it that you think about uh, when your friends talk about invisible stuff like bacteria come to mind? Uh, people always think that bacteria are dirty, but bacteria are everywhere in nature and they do a lot of good things as well. And one of the good things that bacteria do is that they, um, when corals are babies uh -huh. and, and they're basically little larvae that swim to the water column, they swim over this reef and they don't know, like, oh, oh, where, where should I go? Because if I go attached to the bottom, I have to make my skeleton. That means that I'm attached to the bottom from there on. And they can live for 100 years. So if you have to be in one place for 100 years, then you really, really want to pick well. If you, for instance, had to sit on a chair for 100 years, you're really going to spend some time to really pick the really nice chair to sit on for the rest of your life. And corals do something like yeah. this. But then to sort of, instead of picking chairs, what they look for is what the bottom looks like. And bacteria tell, like, this is a nice spot and this is a bad spot. And then this is something that we're experimenting with in the sense that, like, we use that principle that we discovered here to sort of help corals a little bit. So, for instance, what you see here, so this is a tube and then the seawater from uh, the ocean comes in. But what these canisters do, you see this sort of yeah, pillar in there. And what it is, is a filter that takes out all the bacteria from the ocean water. Uh -huh. And then uh, this is even smaller, so the big chunks are getting stuck in here, smaller chunks in here, and then pretty much the water that comes out here has no microbes in it at all. And then if you think about this story, what, like, okay, baby corals like certain bacteria that tell them where to go, we actually put them in ourselves. So this water comes out, it is free of bacteria then comes, on, uh, comes in these jars, so this is water that has no natural bacteria in it, but only the bacteria that we put in there. And then <coughs> you see these little eyeball looking yeah. things in there. So these are little plates, they're made out of limestone, so it's the same as what coral skeletons are made of. And we coated those things with microbes, and then uh, the larvae were added to this uh, cone and they actually pick the uh, tiles that have those bacteria growing on them ah. and then they do way better than when they would have to do everything themselves or in nature. So this is another example in addition to the mini algae that live in uh, corals or the sugar that's in the water of a process because these bacteria you cannot see how um, such an important thing as these bacteria helping corals to find the right spot is a thing that happens on reef that's really important that you cannot see. Amazing. I mean, and, and, and it's, it's all those choices. I, mean, I always, always think it's amazing that you, you, you have a, a coral polyp that needs to choose somewhere to grow for 100 years. I mean, mm -hmm. this is a one-off one -off chance. Yeah. And if they get that wrong, then that's, then that's it. They have to suffer. And it's not that corals cannot change maybe a little bit, but overall, the, the better you pick at the beginning, the better it's going to end for you. And is it getting harder for corals to find good places? Or Well, and that's actually a pretty good question because, like, for instance, what we saw there, because this story is almost related to what we just saw in those blue uh, aquaria. Because you have to sort of imagine that, like, those microbes that live in nature, they're sort of a natural microbe uh, community. But then what happens if there's a lot of sugar going in the water? And, for instance, like, we know already that uh, algae produce way more sugars than corals do. If you then have a lot of sugar in the water, it means that you have a lot of food in the water, and then microbes start eating that as well. And then because you get so many microbes growing in the water, they're pretty much sort of pushing away the microbes that live uh, on the bottom here. So the two stories are sort of related in the sense that, like, okay, if you have a lot of algae that produce a lot of sugar, you don't really want that because then the microbes that are living there naturally, they're not used to that, they cannot fight with these microbes that uh, show up, thanks to these algae, and then if they're gone, then these coral larvae cannot sell or find the places anymore to sell either. So, I mean, what I find fascinating is that in such a short amount of time, in, in, in only really 60 years of coral science, gone from understanding, you know, the big, the big creatures, mm. the reef itself, to coming down to these really Sort of, well, these invisible and, processes. And that, that is a nice thing uh, about doing uh, research at a field station too, because like there is a lot of stuff, and I would actually argue that this is true for a lot of systems, is that people always think that like, oh, there's been uh, research going on for that long and that long and that long and that, that long. Um, you cannot come up with new things, like yeah. everything has been done, everything, but that's not true. Like every day there's people running out of this uh, aquarium building, like, woohoo! Uh, I found something new and new, something that people uh, completely uh, never thought about. And I think that, that that's encouraging because like if you're thinking about becoming a researcher yourself, for instance, like to know that like there is only a little bit 
of how the world works that we know about. And this might be obvious for Corby's because we cannot go on the water for that long. But I've heard similar stories of people that walk into the forest that see something. So, yeah, there is still a lot to be uh, discovered out there. And that makes it sort of interesting. Great. I mean, it, it's, it's fascinating. Should we take some of the questions that have sure. been, been, been sent in? This is, these are from Colombia. Um, Julie would like to know why coral reefs are, are sensitive. Oh, they, sens uh, I'm it, from the Netherlands, so I don't know what that word means. Um, sensitive means... Oh, sensitive. Yes. So they, just like, they like it how they like it. And, and that is, a, a, again, a very uh, a good uh, question. Like, if you think about, like, that first um, aquarium that we have there, yeah. there's no food. It's a hard place to live. So in order to make it work, you have to work together with these tiny algae that are mm -hmm. in the corals. So you have to work together, then you have to work with tiny crabs that take uh, that clean you up with little fish. So what you see in coral reefs is that like a lot of animals, plants, animals, uh, microbes, all start working together and make this sort of what they call a symbiosis. So it only works if they live together. And only when they work together and live together, they can make it work. But then you have to uh, can think about it like, it's a car, like yeah. a car works, if uh, the engine works with whatever is in a car, but there's all these parts that have to be tuned and work together, otherwise a car doesn't work. So and a coral yeah. reef is almost like that, because all these organisms working together is almost like a car engine, and if one thing goes wrong, then yeah. all the other ones break uh, as well, and that's why coral reefs are so sensitive. And then you can actually see that here too, like people have sort of learned about, um, maybe heard about this uh, water, seawater is getting warmer. And the algae that live inside corals don't like that. So what you see here, again, is like a lot of corals that are that brown color again. But then we put this guy in, in that you see over here, and you see that it's white. And what happened there, like if this one had a, went through water that was really warm, the algae start growing really, really fast, and corals don't like that for some reason. And then they throw these algae out. When the algae are thrown out, uh, the color loses its uh, the coral loses its uh, color, and what you see then is pretty much the coral beast itself. And then, if you think about um, corals being close yeah. to the family of uh, jellyfish, they're transparent, so you can see through the beast and see the skeleton that's underneath. That's what I call uh, coral uh, bleaching. But this is one of those good examples, because again, like we talked about it earlier, like corals need those algae to make their food, because otherwise they cannot survive. And when this happens and it takes too long, then these corals die. So that's one of those examples of what makes coral reef organisms sensitive. And, and would this coral here be able to, to take up um, algae again? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, th th that's... Um, because most of the time corals don't bleach all together. Uh, this one is, for instance, uh, still has, that's why it's brown on that side. It still has a lot of uh, these little algae oh, on the left side of it. That now. Yes, and the only reason why um, uh, it's white on that side is because the door of the wet lab is in that direction and the light comes from there, so it gets a little warmer on this side on, than on that side. And that, that makes the difference uh, here. But you can see that like all these little hairs that are sticking out, uh, those are actually similar to the tentacles of a jellyfish. The corals have tentacles too, and they use them uh, and some species more than others uh, to catch uh, food that floats by. So in addition to the sugars that they take from the algae in their tissue, they can catch plankton. And uh, as long as they can do that, uh, they can pretty much keep eating, or certain species can, and sort of go to these periods of warm water uh, and survive still. So they have options. They can eat from the water column uh, and they can eat by uh, taking sugar from their algae. Thank you so much. Um, moving on from that, sort of Eduardo would like to know what, what's the future for the reef? Can, can we see into the future? We, we can uh, uh, see into the future a little bit because uh, a lot of them, and, and this is mostly in the Caribbean, like in the Caribbean, coral reefs started to go uh, down. The coral started really dying almost like 30 years ago. That's where before then, everybody's like, look at these beautiful reefs, they're so strong, nothing is ever going to go wrong. And then in the 80s, the trouble began and corals uh, started dying. And then what you see but is that a coral reef is, say, 10 species. Yeah. There's more, but there, there's a lot of them. And then from back in the day, there's these three species that were always very big. Yep. And those are the ones that are dying. But what we're seeing right now is that there's a lot of smaller ones okay. that, that are still growing. So what the, what's happening is that 
corries are indeed dying in many uh, places, but we also see that the, uh, the composition of corries is changing and that other, some species die and maybe they will die forever. But it's not that, uh, and this is how people often think about corries, is that like every coral is dying. No, there's different coral species and they all react differently. And that what we see now is that we're sort of in a time where maybe the, the ones that were historically making Caribbean reefs are uh, dying, but then there's other ones that are like, ha, huh, now that these guys are out of the way, there's more space for us. Woohoo! And they start actually uh, increasing. So you see a change, and what it's going to be is hard to predict because, again, like there's not a whole well, lot that we know. We also have choices. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, so a lot of the human impacts that may have caused some of these changes, we have choices around what we, what we do in the future. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And then especially if we keep the water clean, so mm -hmm. you keep it as transparent as we saw it in the beginning uh, there, uh, that's a good start. So, um, from um, Jose, would like to know what is the strangest relationship between two animals that you have ever seen? Um, the one that is really weird, there's a few actually, because again, uh, because coral reefs, all the animals have to work yeah. together, there's a lot of weird relationships going on. The two that sort of come to mind, that there is actually a, um, a coral, mm -hmm. and when it gets overgrown by algae, yes. uh, and it doesn't like it, because then it doesn't, the algae in the coral don't uh, receive any light anymore, but if that happens, it can release a substance in the water that calls in a fish that lives in that coral. So the uh, fish is like, again, an example yeah. of living together. Uh, but when an algae sort of starts smothering that coral, starts overgrowing it, the coral is like, okay, this is something I don't want to deal with. I can, uh, uh, I'm going to die if this keeps going. So it lets a substance go. The fish is like, what, what? Comes to the coral, takes the algae out, and then it's, um, um, it's all fine again. And the other one that's even weirder, uh, this is also an example of one of these yeah. symbiosis things, is that people have probably heard from cleaning shrimp. Mm -hmm. So fish live with a lot of shrimps, where shrimps clean fish from uh, parasites. Uh, but to make sure that they, because these uh, little shrimps will actually clean fish that are way bigger than them, and to sort of show, like, I'm a cleaner shrimp, they have a little dance. And then what actually happened is that, like, uh, little fish have learned that dance from the uh, shrimps. So now they dance and become, um, uh, uh, the, the, the big fish is like, oh, I know that dance. It's normally that shrimp, but now it's this fish doing the same thing. And they now come to those fishes and get, get clean. So these okay. fish are like, shrimp t taught me to dance, and now I get food for free. Can you do the dance? Uh, I'll do it later. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we're not quite going to do the, the clean and shrimp dance right now, but we are going to talk about the best bit and the worst bit of being a coral scientist. Well, the worst bit for sure is that it's warm uh, if you're not in the, in, in the water. So we're standing here dripping uh, fresh water. Um, and the best bit is that you're actually... Um, and again, like I, I don't necessarily think that this is uh, something that, that only happens on coral reefs. But for instance, if you're close to any natural ecosystem where it's a lake behind your house or a forest near a yeah. house, uh, to be able to sort of jump in this uh, ocean or to go explore in ecosystems mm -hmm. and try to solve these puzzles that nature provides you is an extremely uh, cool thing to do. And for that I'm actually most grateful and then especially if you can do that on coral reefs. It's, it's an incredible um, privilege. It is, it is nice. But again, like you, you, everybody can do it. Like nature, like I said before, there's a lot of stories that we don't know. So um, go out there. The, 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 there is a lot of people that, that are not even scientists that just by keeping their eyes open have noticed things that later turn into research or create the interest of uh, research. It's that's sort of where it starts. Just start looking, see if you can find something that is like weird and interesting. And, and then, there's a follow-up question from Edgar, when did you know you wanted to be a coral scientist? Was there a sudden switch that you had? No, like the, the, there was a, a thing like in the in the Netherlands, they always had these uh, posters about what, what it looked like yeah. underwater in lakes, and when I saw those, I was like, well, here, that's sort of nice what it looks like, I want to go solve the puzzles in that world, and then at some point I had the opportunity to do uh, coral reef work and yeah. sort of the warmer version of lying in a lake <laughs> in the Netherlands, so I choose that. Brilliant. As long but now as it's not too hot. Too, now it's too warm. It's That's too why it's better to be in the water, actually. Um, well, going, going over to a question from the UK, we've got from uh, Hope in Bristol. 
Uh, what's the most technical piece of equipment that you use? In here? Um, or, or generally? I mean, is, is it scuba, de- scuba gear or deep diving gear, for example? I, it's, it's the most uh, uh, useful one. Uh, again, like that's actually because we're in a sort of, yeah, I wouldn't call it a third world setting, but we don't have a lot of means. Uh, yes, we do have the fancy things like good computers and machines to measure DNA, but I don't think you necessarily need those to do the puzzle solving on the water, uh, that even if you have a measurement tape and a, a microscope, uh, as long the, the reason what makes good research work is a good idea, not necessarily yeah. the, the means available. Brilliant. Um, my computer is just, or phone has just decided to die in the heat. <laughs> um, so, um, whilst I restart that, uh, we'll we oh, hold it in the water, they can do it nowadays. <laughs> I'll put it in the water, it's probably not going to help it even more. Um, so, um, some of the work that we, we've been looking at, and one of the questions that's come up before was about fluorescent coral. And I can see this, this coral starting to fluoresce slightly, mm-hmm. slightly here. Thank you so much. Um, what, what is the point of the f- fluorescing? Yeah, and well, yeah, the, the point of fluorescing is pretty much the, the same reason why we put on sunscreen, uh, especially corals that live very close okay. to the uh, water surface. They get a lot of uh, sunlight, and uh, people probably know that like sunlight is just not a color. It's all these different colors, and amongst uh, the colors, there's also UV light, and we can get skin cancer, and corals don't like it either. Okay. And what they do is they use the uh, fluorescent pigments, they call them, mm-hmm. the uh, fluorescent corals, to sort of take that light that they don't want and change it into something else oh. that is less damaging. So this one that's sort of glowing greenly a little bit is taking or using that pigments when it was still in the water to take light that's damaging and turn it into something that's not so damaging. And if you came in here when it was dark, would we, would we see it even more clearly? Yeah. And if you would take a light that would only emit UV light, you would see it even uh, better because then all of this would actually look like a, like a disco uh, outfit. Because uh, if you do it in the dark with a UV light, you can see it the best. We'll and try it's and get pretty. Some, some, some disco reef uh, photos up online later. Yeah. Um, again, from uh, Bristol, how easy is it to look after coral and could hope grow them at home? Um, in theory, yeah, you could grow them at uh, home because like the uh, thing that you uh, need is seawater, so yes. if you can get that somewhere, uh, give them the light that they need, and then there's a few other things that they need uh, for uh, feeding, and then you could pretty much buy that in a can and add that to them, uh, you're pretty much good to go. And then the only thing that, uh, that makes it often hard is that, again, there's all these symbioses that you want to recreate, so you have to... Uh, make the algae happy, you have to make the shrimp happy that you need and that, that is why keeping corals in a crea is usually very difficult because it's not like a plant that you just put in the ground and then it just grows because plants can sort of do their own thing uh, to large part. Corals, because they're apart from this system with all these symbiosis, uh, uh, symbiosis happening, if you want to build a reef you would have to create not only the coral but also all the helpers that corals need and that makes it a little harder than when you would, uh, for instance, keep a rabbit or um, a plant. Uh, and a general question is, if any of the students watching would like to become a coral scientist, what advice um, would you give them? That's come from a, for a number of students watching. And th- th- that is to start looking into the, the, the puzzles of, of, of nature. Even, even here, there's a lot of people that come from big universities and are like, well, here, we're from a university and we know how the world works. Uh, and then, uh, if that's what you say, come with me on the water, and this is a coral reef, but it could also be uh, in a forest. If that was true, how do you explain this? Because that's not what you're saying. And you can buy expensive equipment, get a lot of money to do research, but everything always starts with a good idea. So if you want to become a researcher, whether that's something, or someone that studies coral reefs, or any system for that matter, to sort of become the Sherlock Holmes of nature is a very good place to start, I think. And, and start seeing uh, uh, the stories that nature tells you and also know that like there's a lot we don't know. So these stories are still there and there's a lot of them. And uh, the Sherlock Holmes of nature, I love that. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's brilliant. Um, 
We're going to go to Baltimore in the US now. Really? And we're going to ask Simon would like to know, have you seen the oceans change over time since you've been coming here? Yeah, that's actually a good one because normally um, when you hear about things changing, you have to talk to your grandfather uh, because it takes a while for things to change. With coral reefs, uh, things change a little faster. Where we, where I went, when I first came to Curacao, which is 20 uh, years ago, um, there were reefs in places that there's none anymore. So yeah, you see things go down. But at the same time, there were also places that had no reefs 20 years ago, where you see them starting to grow. And this is again like the nice thing about being in a field station because corals grow very, very slowly. So they go very, very, very slowly. So to see things change, to see things grow, it, it takes a while. And if you're only here for a month or a year, you, 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 there's not enough time to see that change. But if you're on a field station, you're pretty much here all the time. I've been here for 20 years. And then you sort of catch up with these corals doing their slow things. <laughs> Um, how long did you take to prepare before you could go diving? So there's learning how to dive and then there's probably learning how to do science diving. And that's from Jay. Uh, so Jay, the, uh, that's actually very fast nowadays. Like uh, it doesn't, if you're, um, if you would go to any dive shop, I think nowadays you can learn how to scuba dive in a matter of days to weeks. And then uh, one of the things that would really help with that would be to sort of become a good swimmer. Because to put a dive tank on and sort of jump on the water, it's actually not that hard. You have to learn a few things, but, but that's about it. What really is important that if you go underwater, that you don't want to worry about lo uh, what, what your dive gear does. You just want to be in the water. It's like, that's my second home. And hop, okay, there we go. And uh, this tank makes it even easier. But to feel comfortable in the water, and that is like learning how to yeah. swim well, is a, is a good start. And more important, I would argue, than being able to dive because like everybody can learn that. Um, brilliant, thank you for that. Um, Peter would like to know when did you first become interested in the ocean? Uh, that was really when I was like that big. Really? Yeah, it's the the the, the, the it's almost similar to that the the poster I was talking yeah. about. Um, and of course my parents weren't saying telling me like, okay, you're four years old, go and swim in the water. But what you could do is look in the uh, tide pools, yeah. and there you can sort of see the stories. And, and if, uh, here you can even see corals. There's a lot of interesting going, uh, stuff going on. And that's actually good to know because it's so easy to study. A lot of what we know now about ecology in general yep. is what people discover from looking in these uh, tide pools. So that's how easy it can be. And then looking at those tide pools is uh, very addictive. And that's sort of where the ocean thing started. OK. Um, so go to uh, rock pools, tide pools, depending on what you call them, uh, where you are. Um, we've got some quick fire questions now coming through on the live chat. Um, this is from Christian and Bogota. Um, how long have you been doing research on coral? Uh, right now, I started d looking at corals in '95. So what is it like? 24 years. Yeah, so 24 years. 24 years. Almost. Um, and um, Valeria would like to know um, what's the smallest um, coral polyp and what's the biggest coral polyp? The smallest one is uh, the ones that you get uh, when uh, baby corals just landed and then they will be, so that's baby corals pretty much, and they're small because they're uh, babies. Um, if you would jump in the water right here and go look and then if you're on the Caribbean side of Colombia you could actually go find them yourself because you're right across uh, the ocean right here, yeah. um, is uh, a coral that they call uh, yellow pencil coral and it has polyps that are two millimeters and the yeah. biggest one you can find is something that has polyps that big and that's sort of like yeah the range that you would find uh in the in the caribbean Perfect. so you have everything pretty much uh winston who's in london uk hi winston um would like to know why do we need to do coral restoration why do why does the coral reef need a bit of help the <coughs> That is actually a very good question from Winston. Um, there is no way you, you could sort of build a reef by doing coral restoration alone. Uh, and that's the same thing as like, for instance, you know how to grow oak trees, I guess, in Britain. Uh, you cannot create a forest, right? Because like a bunch of oak trees in the ground that would sort of grow into trees is just a collection of trees. It's not a forest because there's mushrooms, there's animals that you need and you have to sort of deal with it as well. 
on core reads, you have to sort of again see it as an as a machine where everything has to work together. You need the uh, gardeners, so that's the urchins and fish that sort of take away the algae so corals can grow. You have to uh, you need the sponges that are here to take uh, stuff out of the water so the water is clean, and then you need the uh, seeds of a reef uh, to actually settle like we talked yeah. about with those larvae so corals can grow and sort of build that city where fish can uh, live in so there's not one thing you can do like you have to basically if you want to uh, help a reef make it do better you have to make sure the water is clean basically you can do what these sponges do by throwing less trash or, or sewage water into the ocean you can uh, do what the herbivores do, the gardeners, the ones that take the algae away, by making sure, again, that there's no nutrients in the water so algae don't grow. Uh, one of the things that's a little harder is uh, to make sure that these uh, corals, that there's the little coral seeds, the coral larvae, the coral settlers, yep. that they show up. And that's what we can help nature yeah, with. We can help with that. And that's what the ones that you saw there. Yep. So here, corals still recruit naturally, but by doing this, we can make it go a little faster, and that's just one wheel of the big engine that all these wheels you have to turn to eventually get a good reef, but all these wheels can be turned, but yep. it's just not one thing. And a little bit of uh, reducing the fishing as well, because the... Yep. Yep. And, yep. and uh, that, that's the fish thing, like yep. uh, the fish are herbivores too. Yep. So if you don't take all the fish out, they're still the gardeners capable of taking all the uh, algae out so corals can grow. Brilliant. Wonderful question, Winston. Thank you very, very much for that. Um, we're going to Sacramento in California, and Max would like to know, do corals have senses? Yeah, that's actually another really, really good um, uh, question. So, Max, corals do have senses, and the best uh, time to sort of notice uh, or see that they do is when they still have behavior. And the best behavior uh, moment to see behavior in corals is when they're still larvae, because they can swim around. Um, if you are a coral larvae, you can do everything that we can. Uh, they like certain colors of light, they like red colors for some reason, and that's probably because those algae that they want to settle yeah. on, they're red, so they look for that, so they can see. They can hear, so uh, coral larvae flow in the ocean, and then uh, can hear where coral reefs are. So in big in the open ocean, it's very deep, there's only water, there's not a place to settle. Uh, so where are these islands? Where are these reefs that we can uh, go to and settle? They hear where they are. And a coral, a coral larvae cannot swim against the current, but they uh, basically do what balloons do. Yep. So by going high and low in the air, they find the wind going to where they want to do. And okay. that's what coral larvae do too. So they hear where they want to go. And they go hang in the water and it's like, okay, this, this is the current that brings me there. And if it goes that's the wrong way, cool. yeah. they go somewhere else. And then eventually they make it. They can touch or they can uh, sense, so when they crawl over uh, the bottom, what they actually do is they look for tiny, tiny little holes, the, the little seats pretty yeah. much that we talked about, and then find, uh, they're very picky about those, and then go in there. So pretty much corals, and especially their larvae, so that's corals, can do exactly what we can do. Amazing, and we've got uh, time for this one more question, and that's from Sergio um, in Bogota. Um, how does the coral lava attached to the bottom? That is a mystery. So again, but, but this is exactly what I mean. And this is a very, very timely question um, because we don't know. And, and we were thinking about that uh, uh, the other day. And the weird thing that we uh, sort of see right now, uh, because you guys know almost as much about this, obviously, as, as we do, thinking and wondering yeah. about the same thing. So again, that sort of makes the point. This is a good question, and this is enough to start a research project. Um, what we think is going on, and again, I have no idea whether this is true, it sort of looks like there's little bags in corals that uh, can take up uh, minerals from the water. Uh -huh. And then the same way that you need a dive weight to sort of go down, uh, corals fill these sacks with minerals, and while they're swimming, uh, these little sacks get heavier and heavier and heavier, so eventually, like a diver with weights okay. on, they sink to the bottom. They also have uh, little fat reserves that they use and then the, they uh, sink as well. Uh, they can swim a little bit so they could swim the, uh, down. We don't know, but it, it, it sort of looks that that's how they get down and when they're down there, and that's the, 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 yeah. the question, how do you attach to the bottom then? It said that it looks like they use these sacks that they use as a weight belt. Yeah. 
um, because a lot of the minerals is the minerals that they need to make their skeleton that they put them out and then use that as some sort of glue to attach them to the old reef which is also uh, calcium carbonate and then that something like that is happening when they attach themselves but to be honest I have no idea we're looking into it and to be continued I guess well what a wonderful question to end on thank you so much Sergio and for highlighting that we know something about the coral reef but there's so many questions that are still to be answered and there's so many ways in which all of you can become involved in coral research in the future but it's just uh, time now to say thank you so much, Mark, uh, for sparing the time out of your uh, schedules to come and be part of this. And for all those um, classes, uh, students, fantastic questions. Those of you who are at home um, and at Hope and Winston, um, really, really great uh, to have you with us. And that's the, the final broadcast for today. We're back tomorrow. Uh, with sponges and threats to the reef uh, so do join us tomorrow and also on Thursday we're going deeper and then lastly on uh, Friday we're looking a bit at uh, adaptation restoration and uh, the impact of carbon we're talking to, to Rene about his work on Heron Island looking nice. at, at that, that experiment there so wonderful to have you with us until the next time it's goodbye from Curacao and goodbye from Kamabi thank you bye bye bye